Hello and welcome to Ice Fishing for Beginners with Mass Wildlife. My name is Jim Legacy. I'm Mass Wildlife's Angler Education Coordinator, and I'll be your host for this virtual walkthrough on ice fishing. So have you ever been curious about ice fishing, about getting out and fishing through the ice on the hard water in the winter, short of getting out and, and having someone show you, this should give you the confidence to give it a try. And the best part about this, it'll live on our website so you can view it as many times as you need to. So let's get into it. What we'll cover is why ice fish. Why would you want to go out and, and, and spend time on the ice in the winter? Learning to be comfortable on the ice, and that means being safe and knowing how to test the ice, dressing for warmth and comfort, bit about ice fishing regulations. Ice fishing is, is one of the niches within the fishing pastimes and it has a, a, a handful of its own regulations. We'll, we'll cover obviously all the essential ice fishing gear, the most important two things you need to have tip ups and jig sticks to fish through the ice. We'll cover those in depth and then we'll give you some further tips for success. So why ice fish? Why would you wanna get out and ice fish? Well, the most important thing is because it's fun. <laughs> well, why would you do anything unless it's fun, right? Other than work. And for me, this is, this is my work, but ice fishing is great fun, particularly done with families and friends. It's one of the, the more group activities in terms of fishing. Any type of fishing can be group activities, but you typically see a lot of people out ice fishing in groups, having a blast out on the ice. So that's the most important reason to give it a shot is it is fun because you never know what you're gonna catch. People, I always get asked, why would you fish to the ice? The fish aren't biting, it's, what do you catch? It's, you can catch everything that you can catch during the open water season through the ice with just a little bit of knowledge. And the good part is because you can't, there's no visual clues because you're over the ice. A lot of times you don't know what you're gonna catch when that flag goes off or when that rod bends. So it's really that curiosity factor, especially for people that are just starting. That, that makes it that much more wonderful. Because it's what's for dinner. A lot of people are motivated to fish by catching fish and eating them. Um, and fish taste better through the ice in the winter. Um, and, and it's hard to explain, but I can tell you firsthand and I love catching these little guys here, these yellow perch, and they're absolutely delicious caught through the ice in the winter. Um, and there's a variety of other species too. Anything that you can catch that you enjoy eating during freshwater, open water times, um, you can catch during the winter because it's great exercise. There's, there's all kinds of new research that shows you need to stress your body, you know, periodically and periodically for me is a few times a week. And there's, you're definitely gonna do that when you're out um, braving the cold, exercising in that fresh air, um, getting that good vitamin D from the sun. So it is wonderful exercise and it's a good healthy stressor to the system. So um, don't overlook that aspect. It's great for families with, with young folks, anyone obviously, but the young folks, it just makes it that much more interesting. We do a handful of in-person ice fishing events every year and, and it's a very short season and we can't be everywhere. That's another good reason this tutorial will be valuable to you. Um, but families are what it's all about and children just seeing their reaction to, to the flag going off or that fish coming out onto the ice is absolutely priceless. So. It is wonderful for the young ones. And, and perhaps my other biggest uh, factor is it's a tailgate party on the ice. <laughs> you know, and you bring all, you can make a whole day of it. You can, you can do the minimalist thing. Absolutely. I know I have friends that do, and I've occasionally done it. I just want to break away for a couple hours, bring my jig stick and, and keep it really lean and go out on the ice. But most times you, you, you're, you're out there, you're making a day of it. You're eating breakfast, you're eating lunch, you're cooking. You're, you might be skating, throwing the football around, sledding if there's hills nearby. It's just a wonderful um, activity to make a day of it. And, and like to say, it's just like a big old tailgate party on the ice. So before you do any of that though, before you go out and invest in your gear or, or, or go out and try it, you need to know how to be comfortable on the ice. There's no more important factor uh, when you're walking on hard water in the winter in gaining that confidence so to learn how to be comfortable on the ice like this cute young lady on the left here she's she, she's learned to be comfortable on the ice and it's one of her favorite favorite winter pastimes so the, the biggest thing is start by being safe so we always advocate um, a, a life jacket or a pfd sounds a little silly um, to wear that over your winter clothing but it just gives you that much more confidence if you do go in if the worst happens. But if you follow this, the tutorials coming up, that won't happen. It, it'll keep you from ever having that happen. But if you do go in, you'll stay afloat. You'll be able to gain um, 
gain your position again, stay calm, and then get out of the ice. Gives you just that much more confident. A length of rope is is important, especially if you're um, fishing with a two or three or a group. If you did go in, they could throw you the rope. Um, you could take the rope off you and throw it toward them. It, it would be a way to get you out quicker. Um, if the ice is slick, and we'll get into this a little bit more, where these safety spikes, and they come in all different varieties and styles and you know expenses uh, some are cheap some are very expensive but but if the ice is slick and you're not going to put on ice skates which i often do if if i can combine the two it's a blast but if you don't skate you'll you'll want something to give you a grip because walking on on slick glare ice um, with all your gear can be challenging but if you if you throw these on it's it's fantastic it takes all that challenge away Bring a chisel or an auger, some way to test the ice. You need to do that yourself, and we'll show you here in a moment. Um, pack an extra set of dry clothes. Wear the safety spikes around your neck. I kind of zip through this one quick, and you'll see that in the tutorial, too. You'll see all these safety items, and, and it'll explain, I'll explain how to use them. So how thick does the ice have to be to be safe, to be um, you know, thought of as being safe in the winter? Well. We put this chart together and it's based on real science, but it is based on clear blue or black lake ice. That's, that's the strongest, um, physically the strongest ice you can have. Um, and I'm not gonna bore you with the physics of it, um, but that's that it's more early forming ice that, that you don't, the freeze thaw cycle hasn't Im, Im, impeded. You haven't had precipitation thrown in. How often do we get that in Southern New England, right? I mean, generally you're gonna have days that it gets up in the 40s, night times down in the single numbers or even below, you'll get some rain and snow thrown in. So you don't often get that black or blue ice. You get more of that, that milky white ice still can be very safe. You just have to go by the, by the prescribed amount of inches to be safe. So two inches or less, always, always, always stay off that. I would even say four inches or less. We always err on the side of caution. When we do our programs, our in-person programs, we, we say six inches or less, we don't do them, we cancel them because we're asking people to feel comfortable out there and you're not gonna feel comfortable. Six inches is only like, yay, big. It isn't a lot of ice. So, but um, physically, uh, physics uh, aside, you know, four inches is, is perfectly fine with a small group in single file. You get into the five, eight, 10 inches, then you can get into the really heavy loads. Um, we don't often get that, particularly in the eastern, in the southeastern part of the state, you get out in the western part of the state in the Berkshires, you can get ice uh, measured in a foot or more. So if, if, if you need just more confidence, I would go there. I would go either northern New England or the Berkshires out in the western part of the state and, and wait until late January like we are in, uh, filming this in late January right now or February when, when you start to get ice in that one to two feet of thickness where a cold night and day, you can make an inch or more in a day. Then that and that that will give you more confidence. Um, but but physics um, shows that four inches or better, you you can you can get out there as long as it's that that good strong ice. Um, so that aside, how do you determine that? It's not going to be this easy. You're not going to get to a water body and it's going to be posted safe or unsafe. There is no number to call, no website to consult that'll give you that. Um, so you have to be your own advocate for safety, and this is a video to show you how to do that. So Jim Legacy again, Mass Wildlife Angler Education Coordinator. And the first and most important thing about ice fishing is being safe on the ice and being confident in your ability to be safe on the ice. Um, the first couple of things you should have with you, especially if you're new and you've never ice fished before, is a PFD. This will give you all the confidence you need. If you did happen to go in, worst case, you'd be floating which would give you the ability to, to, to stay on that surface and dig in and get yourself out. The other thing you should always wear, whether you're a, a, brand, a brand new ice angler or a veteran, are these ice spikes. Um, they're basically just little um, sharp objects um, that you can hold in your hand. You always wear them around your neck. There's a variety of different kinds. But basically, just if you did fall in again, you can just pick your pick your way back out and, and, and use your upper body strength to pull yourself out of the water. Very, very important safety item to wear. If you're fishing with a buddy or a group, as often we do when we ice fish, you should bring a length of rope. If someone does go through in your party, you can throw this to them and, and the, the other folks can drag you out. Again, worst case, um, what I'm gonna show you next, you generally don't have to worry about any of this. You should still have it with you, um, but, being able to test the ice for, for strength and safety is your number one uh, thing. 
um, to be able to do. So we're gonna we're gonna take these off while I test the ice. And the way to test the ice is a very simple procedure. You, there is no website to consult or number to call to tell you if this pond is safe, if that uh, lake is safe or not safe. You have to do this yourself. You have to be your own advocate for safety. So the first thing you do, you come down to the, the water's edge. On the very edge, we're at the boat ramp here on South Pond, Lake Quasit, Central Massachusetts, early February here. Um, a good indication that the ice is safe you'd pan around and you see other people on the ice. You see other groups here, other groups over there. Then you can say, okay, it must be, you know, it must be safe. However, I never trust anyone else. I want to find out myself. Some people will push it. Uh, Mass Wildlife recommends four inches, uh, minimum four inches of black or blue ice for, for safe ice. Um, what generally happens in Southern New England is you get the freeze thaw mixed in, you get precipitation mixed in. So you get more of that white milky colored ice like we have here today and we have snow on top. So that ice is not going to be as strong. So we like to see at least five or six inches. So we got to test that. We got to we got to walk down. We're going to pretend there's no one out on the ice today, even though there's a few groups. We're going to walk down right to the water's edge. We're right at the shoreline, the boat launch here. We're just going to kind of move the snow aside here, and we're in maybe a foot deep of water. And I'm going to jump up and down, literally just jump up and down, and feel if anything gives or cracks under my feet. I don't feel anything giving or cracking. I'll go a little further out still maybe in 12 to 18 inches of water, jump up and down, it's a little slushy on the surface, nothing's giving. So that's a good sign. If you were to feel, now, if you were to feel cracking under your feet or the ice actually moving, you'd probably call it a day and say it's not safe. Um, never push it beyond that. But this ice is feels really solid now. I'm gonna move out a little further because I'm gonna use a uh, good old hand dog or a six inch hand dog, or you can do it with a chisel or a small hand dog to see how thick the ice is. We're gonna go a little further out. This might be foot and a half to two feet. So if you were to go through, it would not be the end of the day. It would be maybe up to the top of your boots. So plant your feet, just start drilling. Take your skimmer, kick the slush aside. Some people like to leave that as it kind of insulates the hole on really cold days and keeps the uh, the ice from freezing. I like to just get it out of the way entirely. Take your skimmer, move all the slush out. Remember, we're right on the shore here. Good little common sense too is when, you, when you're drilling near the shore, don't drive this down into the bottom. Just, just as soon as you punch through, bring it right back up because you don't want to mess up those blades. And if you have a chisel to check it, all the better, because that won't matter if you punch it to the bottom. Okay, now we're gonna turn the skimmer upside down. We're just gonna, I'll take my glove off here. We're just gonna put that, the hook right on the bottom of the water, on the bottom of the ice here. Put it down till you literally hook the bottom of the ice. I'm gonna put my hand right on the, on the, the surface of the water column. Now you're gonna measure from, from the hook to my finger, that's a good eight or nine inches. So eight or nine inches, even though it's the it's not honeycombed ice, it's it's just that white ice with a lot of freeze and thaw and precipitation mixed in, it's plenty strong enough. So there is your indication that you're probably gonna be okay. Now you wanna stake out your location on the water. You look over, you'd probably already know roughly where you're gonna set up. Say you wanna set up in that cove or off that point. You'll still want to check it a couple more times on the way out. You will never assume that it's going to be the same thickness that it is on the shore. Ice freezes first on the shore and last out toward the middle and vice versa. And, and it thaws out in late winter and early spring from the shore and it's thicker out in the middle. Use those few little uh, safety precautions. You'll have no problem out on the ice this winter. All right, folks. So that's all there is to it. So you saw where I just had a means to get through the ice in some way to measure it. And that's where you're, you need a skimmer, you need a, a chisel or a hand dog or any way to get through. And we'll talk more about those in a bit. But if you just take those two, go right off the shore and, and, and get through the ice, and then you can tell if it's safe. Um, what generally happens is people are so eager after a short freeze up, just a few days that, that they'll get out and they won't test it good enough. They'll look, and as you can see this ice right here, has these these deep cracks in it which is a good thing that's we'll talk about this that's that's making ice but 
they'll just look at the crack and they'll see that it's you know four or five inches and they'll they won't test it and they'll walk out on it which is a mistake you definitely want to always test it right from the shore and go out and keep in mind too i, I didn't mention this is you really need to allow the ice to form it's not gonna you know you get that first cold snap in late december january where you'll get two or three days and it may be below zero for a couple nights that's not enough um, it, it, you need seven to 10 days of freezing weather day and night for the most part. Obviously, it can get up a little above freezing in the day. We have very short days, but as long as it's pretty much around freezing and, and well below freezing at night, that ice is going to form after seven to 10 days. If you don't get that, you just get a few days of it, don't push it. So you'll also get um, these kind of scary, eerie booming and kind of cracking and popping sounds when you're out on the ice. And that can freak out a lot of people, uh, particularly new ang new ice anglers. And with good reason, you're, you're using your senses and it doesn't sound healthy, but believe me, that is typically, especially, you know, during times of cold weather, that's ice expanding. When ice expands, that's making ice on the water body. It is doing that popping and, and booming uh, sounds. It can be so intimidating, but that's actually a good thing. Conversely, obviously, if it's during a period of a long thaw or late winter and you're hearing that and you're feeling it underneath you, then it's probably uh, receding. It's it's not a good thing. So obviously use common sense, but most of the time if you're hearing and you're in deep cold and you're hearing popping and, and booming sounds, that's that's actually making ice out there. That's a good thing. And again, if you're walking and you feel the ice move underneath you and you, you see it crack, um, back off where you were, test the ice. Remember, ice is going to be its thickest near the shore because like I said, it makes, um, you, the ice starts to form from the shore out. So a lot of times you can you can fish right near the shore or in these little tight coves and get seven, eight, nine inches of ice and out in the middle of a big lake, it's still open. You would just stay away from that little open areas. In late winter, it's going to be safest out in those deeper waters because that's the, the last ice that formed and the last ice that goes out. And as you get towards shore, it's going to start to ice out earlier. So a few other safety precautions, we can't stress this enough. Stay away from early forming black ice, like, like we already talked about. If it looks, um, it, it may look safe. It's got that dark color. It's got those nice cracks that's starting to form, but it's probably going to be too thin after just a few days. Um, stay off rivers and streams in southern New England here. The only exception to that rule is uh, slow oxbowed sections of, of, of larger rivers like the Connecticut or Merrimack. An oxbowed section is just an uh, uh, area of the river that was cut off geologically over time. It was cut off from the main channel. It's very slow, lazy stretch. These can gain, these can get really thick, just like a pond or a lake. It just takes a little more time. But any main channel of a river or stream here in Massachusetts, I would not get on no matter what. Um, these are the, you'll see these in Northern New England and Canada, and that's perfectly acceptable. They have longer, deeper, colder winters, but not here in Southern New England. Uh, watch out for that honeycomb slot, soft, slushy ice, particularly after long periods of thaw or late in the winter, late February, March. And it literally looks like a slushy just sitting on, and you could, you, you put your, your chisel or your auger through and it's going to drop right through. It may look like it's okay to jump on, but it's not. So just beware of that type of ice. Make sure you test the ice. I already talked about this in multiple locations, not just from shore and assume it's going to be great out in deeper water or off that point or in that cold. Test it multiple times. Uh, beware of shore edges. This is going to sound a little funky, but the northern edge of the pond or lake in the winter is going to be the one you have to watch out for. The sun angle being what it is in the winter is going to, if it's a sunny day it's in, and there's no snow to reflect on the shoreline, that shoreline is going to heat up. And, and start to melt and erode the ice on the northern edge of the pond. So always look for the southern or, or kind of the western edge of the pond. Those are areas that are less exposed to the sun. The northern edge, because the sun angle is exposed to the sun a lot more in the winter and the eastern edge. Um, so particularly the northern edge. So if you can get on the south part of a pond, that's all the better. Um, so on lakes and ponds, avoid stream inlets. Again, that's that moving water in outlets. A lot of lakes have, you know, that, that aren't spring fed or some that even are spring fed, have streams that feed them coming in and going out. Um, in some impoundments, which are man-made waters, that's exactly how they're made. The stream will come in and, and they've dammed it up and then they've allowed for water to escape. So stay away from those. Those, those, those are you know weaker areas of, of the water because it's moving water. So dressing for warmth and comfort, we're not gonna tell you how to dress. Everyone should know how to dress by now if you're an outdoor enthusiast. Uh, I'll just say there is no bad weather, only bad clothing you can always get comfortable. 
So here's the right clothing. Um, again, layer up. I, I've done it here for you today. I've got a base layer that's a moisture wicking layer, then a layer here, and then a, you know, another another layer to protect your core. And then you can you, you throw on a kind of a wind resistant shell. Those are the two biggest things. So a, a base layer is going to be moisture wicking and a wind resistant shell. And then you just either let, take put layers on or take layers off to gain your comfort level. You're going to be moving. Um, you, and, and that's going to get you to sweat. And that's why this moisture wicking base layer is important. Cotton feels really good against your skin until it gets wet. And then it feels horrible because it's going to get cold once you stop moving and, and you're going to be in trouble. So again, a, a moisture wicking base layer and a wind break. Because a lot of times in the winter, you're going to have that predominant wind out of the north northwest. And even if you're layered up with good quality clothing, but don't have that outer kind of a, even just a simple rain jacket that's a good wind resistant barrier you're going to be cold so those are the two biggest things and then how many layers you put on in the middle is depends on you protect your extremities that's another big one so gloves um, something on your head even down to your neck level your balaclava good warm boots um, you don't have to break, break the bank here just a good warm boots you can even an uh, inexpensive pair with two or three layers of socks and again your, your first layer of socks should be a moisture wicking base layer proper traction we talked about it, um, you know, if, if these little grippies, you can get them from $5 to $50. So depending on your price range, but they'll give you the ability to keep your traction when the ice conditions uh, are, are slick or glare. If you get a good layer of snow or slush over it, you're probably going to be fine. Um, and if you're a skater on glare ice, I, I see a lot of people ice fishing in skates and I do it myself. And it's a wonderful way to combine two different outdoor activities and eye protection. I have lighter colored eyes, particularly those that have blue eyes and hazel or green eyes are going to want to wear um, some way to keep the, 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 the sun off you. And especially in the winter, it's lower, the angle's lower, so it's going to be more in your eyes, um, depending on, on where you're facing on, on the time of day. And if there's snow, it's going to reflect up and even be stronger. So good pair of polarized sunglasses. They're not expensive anymore, so are, are excellent to have. So um, there are a few regulations when it comes to ice fishing. Ice fishing, you, you all obviously you abide by all the length and, and amount of fish you can keep per day. That's called creel. So some fish have length limits before you can keep them. Some have the amount. So a creel limit on how many you can keep per day. So those are going to be 365, 24, seven, um, whether you're open water fishing or hard water fishing, but there are some rules and regulations specific to ice fishing. So, Obviously, again, you're going to need a license if you're a fishing license in Massachusetts, if you're 15 years of age and older, every state is different. So if you're, if you're going to Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine, New York, out, out west somewhere, Midwest, check their regulations because some states require it as early as 12 years old and some it's 16. Um, so, so in our state, it's 15 years old. It's, it's free for fishing until you're 18, 15, 16 and 17. You have to possess it, but it is free. So just make sure you start there. And in, in the, the important, the other important uh, regulation in terms of ice fishing is how many hooks you can have in the water at one time. And, I, and, and it's defined in our regulations as hooks, but I like to think of it as lines in the water or a device that you, you can catch one fish, designed to catch one fish at a time. So in open water times, you can have two rods in the water. So those are two devices designed to catch one fish each at a time. But in ice fishing, you can do five. So you can have five tip-ups and we'll get into tip-ups and jig sticks in a moment here, but you can have five tip-ups in the ice at, on, through the ice at one time designed to catch fish per person. So we, we, we define it as a hook, but really that don't think of it as a single hook. Think of it as a device designed to catch one fish. It could be a lure, it could be a lure with three treble hooks on it. Could be, you know, which would come into play if you're jigging, if you're using one of those mini rods through the ice, but a tip-up um, an ice fishing tip up, which we'll show you here, it usually has one hook with your small fish or worm on it. So you're allowed five of those at one time. So think of it lying in the water with a hook designed to catch one fish. So just remember that. And again, other states have different regs. Some states allow only two per person. Uh, we allow five and some allow more. Um, so just remember a device designed to catch a single fish at one time. Um, so what I typically do is I'll have, I, I like to tip up fish and jig fish so I'll, I'll put your so i'm allowed five at one time i'll put the four tip ups i'll set four tip ups and then i'll jig i'll walk around and drill holes and take my little fishing rod all, known as a jig stick and, and jig while those four 
uh, tip-ups are working for me. So again, there's an example, but you can just use five tip-ups if you want, not jig. Um, or I guess you, if you're really coordinated, you could have five holes and five jig sticks <laughs> going at one time. It'd be pretty hard to do. So, so just abide by that regulation. And the other big one is people get into trouble. Um, they bring young people out or they bring people that have never ice fished. They don't know how to set up. They don't know how to um, operate a tip up. Um, so, but they count those people in their numbers. So in other words, if I went out with a young person, I was just teaching them how it wouldn't be smart for me to have my five in and then their five. If I was, if I was manning their five as well, because, oh, there's another person with me. I'm allowed 10 now. Well, not really, unless that other person can man their own five as well. So just keep that in mind. And th so that person has to be able to take the tip up out of the water, as you're going to see, and, and set the hook and bring the hook, bring that fish in, or if they're jigging the same thing, they need to be able to physically bring that in. So what I, what I did when my, my kiddos were younger is I would just take my five and go out. And then we just take turns if the flag went off um, until they were able to to, 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 you know, maintain that themselves. So don't get into trouble there thinking that, oh, I've got another person, I can put five more in, but I'll man them. That's, that's against the law. And you have to be out there physically on the water body manning. You can't, <laughs> you can't set your tip ups and then go inside and keep warm by the fire and occasionally come out and check them. Please, a lot of people think that that's acceptable. You have to be over your tip up on the water watching. Essential ice fishing gear. This is when we really get into the meat of the of the tutorial here, folks. So you can't go out ice fishing if you don't have the right gear, right? So let's get into it. Obviously, you're fishing under the ice, through the ice. You need some way to cut through the ice. So on your screen from left to right, I'm going to show you the four basic ways to do it. And I've lined them up in, in, in order of my personal preference here. This doesn't have to be yours. So on your left here is a hand chisel. Otherwise, some, some people call them spuds. You see a lot of people with homemade ones, but you can buy them for $20, $30, $40. And it's just a long steel rod with a sharp end. And it needs to be a sharp end. And if you use these, you need to have some way to keep it attached to your wrist. Because picture your chisel and you're chiseling through the ice and you break through and all that momentum sends that chisel out of your hands down to the bottom of the water column, which, you know, and, and it happens all the time. There's a lot of chisel standing upright or laying on the bottom of water columns because people just disregarded that little wrist strap or piece of rope on the end. So do that. Um, it's my least favorite. It, it's a workout. If it's very, you know, five, six inches of ice, which is safe, as we talked about. If it's not much ice, then yeah, you can chisel through pretty quick. And if you're the ultra minimalist, you can take your chisel, your jig stick, and maybe a little uh, backpack with some uh, you know, assortments of lures um, and some refreshments with you. And you just spend a few hours on the ice and that's a great way to do it. However, if the ice starts to get six, eight, 10, 12 inches of ice, and you're not good with that chisel, um, some people still swear by them in, in thick ice, but I don't. <laughs> I think it's a workout for your, for your joints, especially as you get older, I would go to the auger. So next up here would be, would be the good old power auger. Um, I keep and maintain one for program activities and nothing cuts through the ice quicker and makes holes faster than a power auger. While I've, why I have lined it up here toward the left, toward my least favorite, it's because they're expensive, they're stinky, they're, they're gas fuel oil mixed, that makes them very powerful. They have a good low end torque and they cut through the ice super quick, but they are heavy. They weigh 35 pounds or so. You're, you're getting a lot of the gas fumes on you and around you. They're very noisy. So if you're trying to, you know, not make that bad impression on a water body early in the morning and wake up all those, all those folks that live around there, um, the, the power auger is going to do that. Um, so for those reasons, I, I shy away from it. If I'm running an event where I need a quick hundred holes drilled before it, that's my go-to. But it, personally, I won't use it. Getting closer to my favorite here would be uh, the hand auger, which is just a, an awesome tool. Very inexpensive, 50 or $60. I've seen them as low as $40 on closeouts. And, and they, they get you, with, if the blades are sharp and properly maintained, they get you through the ice very quick. You have to use your own upper body strength, obviously. Um, but it's an inexpensive way to get through the ice. And you can cut through two or three feet of ice um, with sharp blades in short order. You just have to have some amount of upper body strength and the blades need to be sharp. You don't want to disregard keeping the cover on. Don't 
lay it down carelessly because if the blade gets even a little bit dull, it won't cut at all. It'll just spin on the top. So maintenance is key. My, my, my favorite all time is to take the lower part of a hand auger and mount it on a plate and put a portable drill on top. These are conversion kits that become power augers. And they make standalone power augers as well. There's a couple of different makes, but those are prohibitively expensive. They can be as expensive, if not more, five, $600 as the, as the, the gas powered augers. So these are a great compromise. The drill, you're gonna have a good 18 um, bolt cordless drill mounted on this little plate, which generally is 80 to hundred dollars. And then you take the lower end of your hand auger and mount it here. And you're looking at a couple to $250 and you've got something you can use all year with a cordless drill and something you can use through the ice. They cut quiet, they're lightweight, there's no fumes, they're 12, 13 pounds. They, they do an excellent job cutting. I can, I can put this up against any of these and cut very fast. And if you get a good uh, you know, three or four amp hour battery, you'll cut a hundred or more holes very easily on a cold winter day. You don't want, the limitations on this obviously is the diameter of the, the, the blade with the hole you're cutting. So if you're trying to cut eight or 10 inches, this is not going to be the tool. You'll want to go to the, the power auger or, or use a lot of upper body strength and, and use a hand auger. Um, these are, this is a good setup if you're using four to six inch uh, blade sizes. So those, those are all your tools for getting through. You need one of them at least. So now gear for catching, jig sticks and tip ups are the main two uh, to get through the ice. I use both and we'll talk about both. Other necessary gear, a means to transport your gear. I, I pull a little, a little, most of my gear with a little sled like this one. They make them in a variety of sizes. Again, if you wanna go minimalist, you can just use the backpack um, or any old backpack with your, your chisel or auger and your, your, your tip ups or, or your, 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 um, your your jig sticks. A bait container. If you're using tip ups, you're generally using shiners, small fish. I'll show you those in a moment. And you will need to transport them in the water, in water, like with one of these containers. An ice scoop, as you already saw, for scooping out the slush when you cut your holes. And then a sounding weight. We'll look at what those are in a moment. Comfort items. If you're spending the day out there, obviously, hand, toe, and body warmers. Some Something um, hot to drink. I prefer hot to drink if I'm cold. And then, um, and then food, you can just bring sandwiches or whatever, but you can also bring a little grill or even cook out over an open fire. And a warming fire is awesome. Don't ever let anyone tell you you can't have a fire on the ice. Never heard of still your thing. There are obviously town waters and lake association properties that are private that prohibit that, prohibit the public from even going in, let alone having a fire. But if it's a public water body, great pond, go ahead and have a fire right on it. It's perfectly safe heat rises, you'll get a little pool of water around it if you set it right on the ice, but it's not going to melt the ice and go through. What I like to do is put a, take a metal, metal trash can lid and build my fire on it. And as you get that little pool of water, I just move the metal lid around. Nothing like a nice warming fire on a cold day on the ice. Kids in particular love it. You can cook your food right on it. Um, and then if, if you want to be super uh, cautious after um, you, you obviously put it out and then you can drag the the, the what's left of the wood if there's any and not just ash to the shoreline making sure it's out but you know even you know you can let it just melt right down and through the ice too it's just structure for fish after that so gear to consider well we've already talked about power augers this is if you really get into it and you want convenience items obviously the power auger is the way to go uh fish finder remember these find the fish they don't catch them for you so you'll be in the game though you'll you'll be where the fish are better apt to catch them if you buy one of these and learn how to use it and they make these in all different varieties and in and, and monetary amounts and then a way to get out of the cold so if you really get into ice fishing and, and you don't care if it's really cold you can make yourself warm out there beyond the clothing you can get inside a shelter like this and they're all different price ranges too from a hundred dollars on up um, you can have a little space heater inside you can literally fish jig in it and you can watch your tip-ups so stay comfy and warm. So all these, all these things to consider if you, if you get into ice fishing. Baits that you have to have, <clears throat> unless you're just going to use lures and a jig stick. Uh, most people use live baits and the, the number one is going to be your shiners. Same as you'd use during open water times. That's why these were filmed during open water times. You can see the greenery in the back. Um, then just um, some small grubs. These are mealworms, but you can use mealworms. You can use fly larvae too, mousy grubs, they call them. There's moth larvae um, too. All, all these insects, a lot of them have, have larvae that you can use to tip or just use it right on your tip ups um, like earthworms. Earthworms are great for catching trout right under the ice on your tip ups. 
So those are kind of more advanced tips and techniques that you can find in a variety of places. But those are three major bait types you'll use. So let's get right into the tip up and jig stick techniques. Tip ups are no more than three small pieces of held to wood, uh, three small pieces of wood held together by two little bolts uh, with screw eyes. Um, a spool of line that you can see here to hold your ice fishing line. Ice fishing line is that kind of a waxed braided line and you just put a little uh, two or three foot length of monofilament or fluorocarbon on the end to put your hook and bait. And then you know a, a, a steel um, a piece of steel spring with a flag on the end and a trip mechanism that, that trip it go off and we'll show you that coming up here. So let's set one up. My name is Jim Legacy. I work for Mass Wildlife and coordinate the Angler Education Program. And today we're going to set a tip up. Very basic um, operation here. There's just a couple critical steps you need to know to put the bait in the right location and to make sure you can actually catch fish. So the first thing we do, here's your standard tip up right here. There's nothing much to it. Three, three bars uh, of wood, a little spool, um, a trip mechanism, and, and a little spring steel as a flag. So we're going to open that up to start with and then secure the set screws down so it's formed into a cross and then take the, the flag out just like that. And the first thing we do, the most critical thing in the entire procedure is we have to sound the hole. And sounding the hole is just figuring out the depth at each individual hole when you're ice fishing. So nothing to it, you use what we call a sounder, surprisingly. And we're just gonna put that on your hook and drop that down in the water column, slowly. So there's all different kinds of sounders. Some of them have little springs on them. This one just has a little clip. You clip right onto the hook like that. And we're just gonna drop it right down into the water column, just like that. And we're just gonna let it slowly cascade down so it won't fall off that hook. We're in fairly deep water here. I think we're just about on the bottom now. Okay, so now we're on the bottom and we know that because we can feel the, that sounder, that little two ounce sounder just literally thudding on the bottom. So then we're gonna put our depth, you can use an ice bobber or a just a just a button you can put on it in the old craft store. Um, you can grab these buttons and slide them on your ice fishing line. And you're just gonna slide that down to the, the top of the water column like that. So you've got a straight line down to your sounder and you're gonna pick it up and slide that button two feet-ish toward the sounder or toward the bottom. And what that's gonna do, that simple operation, is just gonna keep your bait off the bottom and not hiding in the, on the bottom in the weeds and in the rocks. And then after that, you're just gonna bring the entire setup right back up onto your spool. And the average tip up is probably, you know, 12 to $15, that kind of thing. And there's some really elaborate ones you can buy, but these are the really cheap ones. And then you're just gonna take the sounder off away from the hole um, so you don't drop it down the hole. And then we need a shiner. Shiners, um, you can get them at bait and tackle shops and these are golden shiners, typical New England pond shiners. And what I like to do with the shiner is, is put it on the hook under the dorsal fin above the spine. So kind of like where the dark, uh, meet, dark uh, skin meets the lighter skin. And it's wiggling around really good. The other way you can do it is by right under the lips through the lips, I should say, but I just, I don't like the way they swim and they, they breathe by opening and closing their mouth with their gills. So it kind of cripples them a little bit and they may die quicker. And you also have a little split shot weight, which gets that light shiner down into the water column. So then you just put it right back down in the water column, slowly. It's going to probably drop slow anyway, unless that <laughs> split shot's a um, little heavier, but I like to use just a little light one. So that shiner swims more or less naturally. Just gonna let that go until the button is right on top of the spool. And we're probably fishing in at least a good 20 feet of water here, so it's gonna take a little time. And this operation changes with each hole. I mean, you could be in five feet of water or 50 feet of water. That's why finding the bottom is critical and setting your depth button is critical. And there we go, it's right, it's right on the top now. Now you just have to set the flag. And that's your trigger mechanism right there. You're just going to bring the flag down and put it on the open side of that trigger mechanism, just like that. So you want to put it on the open side so if the fish bite, it triggers that flag to go off. So we'll do that. And then there's considerations for the wind. So the wind today is kind of blowing out of the north, northwest, more of a north right now. So you want to set it so that the, the wind doesn't 
knock it off the trigger. Um, if you were to set it like that, the wind might blow it right off. So we want to kind of face it toward the wind, drop it down in the water column slowly, making sure the button is visible, and you've just set a tip up. All right, so let's review that really quick. You're going to drill and chip out and skim away your hole and open the tip up, and that's just a matter of just on un crossing it and sit, putting these, you know, th these are wing nuts. Some of them have set screws and just cranking them down. So it, it forms that cross and sits on top of that hole. Uh, you're going to attach the sounding weight <clears throat> and there's a variety of them. Again, you're just going to put that down to you attach it right to the hook and drop it down to the water column. Uh, when the weight touches the bottom, you're going to have this little, I use just a regular button that you'd have, you know, a shirt button or a pant button. Um, and you just put that on your ice fishing line when you set your rig up that's the thing. When you get your tip up, you're going to have to put the ice fishing line, set it up, and there's YouTubes that'll show you how to do that. Um, but once done, then you slide that button right to the right to the waters, right to the top of the water, where you can feel that that two ounce uh, sounder hitting the bottom, and then it's a straight line down. And then you're just going to move it a little more forward, and that operation is just going to keep your bait off the bottom when you're actually fishing. Um, and then you're going to put your bait. You're going to bring that whole thing back up, put your bait on. And then drop it back down till you see the button um, just about to come off the spool. And then you're going to set the flag. And, and I can't stress this enough. This is the mechanism in most. Some are a little different, but most of the ones you're going to find in the store are going to have this little, this little trip mechanism. Um, and you want to set that your, your spring steel flag hook on the outside of that, not in this part on the inside, because it's going to trigger this way. So if a fish bites and you set it on the wrong side, you're not going to know if a fish bites, the flag's not going to go off. So that's kind of critical. But but just know your tip-ups. If you get a bunch that someone gave you or you bought some that have a different mechanism, know that before you get out there. So there's really not much to it. It's really, really uh, intuitive once you've done it a couple of times. So now we're going we're gonna to talk about actually catching a fish. Um, once that flag goes up, um, this this uh, this guy's going to show you what you do next. All right. So the best part of ice fishing is when this happens. The flag goes up. You come running over. Newbies, people that have never ice fished before, love this because the flag is up, indicating possibly there's a fish on. So what you're going to do is you're going to come up to the hole. You're not going to be too eager. You're going to slide up, skate up, however you want to get to the hole. You're going to come in and see if the spool is turning and indeed the spool is turning on this one that's your second indication that you have a fish on this is your first when this goes up and if the spool is turning there's a fish taking your line out so you want to be very careful they're very some some fish are very touchy about how they um hold their, what they feel on the on, on the other end of the line so you want to pull this up slowly lay it down on the ice now your indicator button's also gone another great sign that you have a fish at least there biting so then you want to pick up the line with your hand like this, and you want to physically feel if there's a if there's a fish on. And I'm pulling it in like this. I can feel a little tugging back. Then you want to just give a little tug up. We're using circle hooks, so they pretty much set themselves. So then you just want to hand over hand, bite the fish back in. And you want to kind of pull put the line up on the side like this so it isn't all like balled up right here, right at the hole, making a big mess. And if you have a buddy, they can actually be taking that in while you're while you're fighting the fish. Then you just bring the fish right up through the hole like that. In this case, it's a nice chain pickle. One of your classics in the winter. You want to grip them really good like this. Yeah, and we have a circle hook on this. So usually they're just caught in the upper or lower jaw. Really easy. And they have to be 15 inches in mass to keep. This one's right in that ballpark. But we're going to set this, this, uh, this young fish free today. And the best way to do this is to put it right down the hole head first. Don't put it tail first and struggle. Just put it right down the hole head first and free it up. And you've just caught a fish through the ice. And that's all that there is, folks, to that. It's really simple, um, fairly intuitive. And if you use circle hooks, like I recommend, the fish often set it themselves. And I gave a minor uh, tug there because it felt like a small fish. But sometimes if it feels like a really strong fish, you might want to tug it a couple really good hefty tugs on that. So the other kind of um, technique for, for fishing through the ice is with a jig, jig sticks, like this young lady's doing right here. It's a mini fishing rod with a, with a, with a smaller reel on it. Um, and it's, it's great fun and you can physically just drop it down. I'll show you the techniques here. You're just gonna 
Um, it, and they, we call it jigging because of the motion you put to it once you drop it down. And it can be very, very effective. And some anglers prefer just to jig, not even set the tip ups. And that's kind of the minimalist way to, to go ice fishing. So, so a combination of, of live bait and lures is probably best to put on the end of your line in this case. Um, I use a little, there's all kinds of jigs. I'm not going to name them. There's, there's so many different kinds, but just do a, a quick search on, 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 on the best ice fishing jigs and it'll come up and just purchase a few of them. And then you put a little grub, like a, a, just a little larvae grub that you can buy in, in most tackle shops um, in even some big box stores, you know, local gas stations and hardware stores will even sell them. And you put that on the hook of the jig and drop it down all the way to the bottom of the water column. Um, and why on the bottom? Why are we setting the tip up and, and jigging off the bottom? Well, there's there's a weird paradox in the winter. Water is its um, heaviest at at um, four degrees um, Celsius, which is about oh forty degrees or so Fahrenheit. So the warmest water is is that at that at that um, density is going to drop to the bottom. So it's actually going to be warmer water is going to be on the bottom, and the colder water is going to be above it. And most of the fish that you'd go after are going to be seeking out the warmest water. That they can find so they're going to be on they're going to be on the bottom but as the winter wanes oxygen levels wane on the bottom so they'll come up further in the water column other fish will just swim looking for places things to eat and places to other habitats to find something to eat so they'll be moving around but start in the bottom whether you're tip up fishing or jigging and then move up through the water column and fish it from the bottom up and an erratic motion jigging up and down you drop it to the bottom reel it up a foot or two and then just that little jigging motion where you're just bringing the tip of the rod up and dropping it down and this varies some sometimes the fish want a more aggressive kind of motion some it's just very very subtle and when you see the tip of the rod bite sometimes it's super subtle you just you'll you'll see the bite you'll just bring the rod up and you'll fight the fish in and if you don't catch if you don't have any bites in the first five six seven minutes no more than 10 minutes move to the next hole a good technique is just to drill five or 10 holes and then just work them all. When you find <clears throat> when you find fish in one hole, a lot of times there's gonna be a lot of fish in and around that hole. So you'll wanna stay, um, you wanna stay right there. If you don't find them quick, just keep moving around. So some tips uh, for success, um, you know, beyond the, the, all the equipment you need and, and setting it up and hoping, um, the, the very first thing that I would recommend is to go to our website, Google Mass Wildlife, Hit that fishing tab right on the on the on the forward facing page, and then scroll down to the Go Fish Mass um, app that we have. This is the best tool. We we are we're going to have a tutorial online for this too, so you can 10 15 minute tutorial. You can walk through all the particulars of how to use it, but it'll be a great place, a great tool to find a location to fish. And then the great part about this is the ones that with modern bathymetry, which is just um, your water depths um, at different locations in the pond. The modern ones we have, you can literally take your phone, go onto this app and walk out on the pond and, and find exact depths you're fishing. And this is important in the winter because certain fish like certain depths. And, it, and if you're fishing deeper water, you can find the deeper water right away. So you'll know you're over it. If you want shallow water, say you're pike fishing, you can you can find that shallow water right away on water bodies. And we're, we're mapping out different water bodies every year. We're always adding content to this. So the goldfish mass, app on our fishing page is, is where you want to start. And it has all kinds of great uh, tools for you. Other veteran tips are, is know where, where your fish live in the winter. And again, we already talked about this start on the bottom and work around. Um, as winter progresses in the spring, less oxygen is on the bottom. So the fish are going to move to where they can find more oxygen up higher in the water column, oxygen up higher in the water column inlets, outlets where the water's moving. Again, be careful there because the ice might be thinner. So just always test those areas, but the fish are gonna move around. They, they need oxygen just like they do during open water season. So um, same old fish, you're gonna catch all the same species that you can catch in open water times that you can catch it, and you'll catch during the winter, whether it's pickerel, pike, yellow, white perch, uh, calico bass, small largemouth bass, panfish, all of them are available in the winter. Um, don't drill your holes too close. This might seem appealing, especially if you're getting older like me and you don't want to walk as far. What happens though is you'll get a big old fish sometimes that'll take your line and and if your tip up lines are too close, like 10, 15 feet apart, they can tangle those lines. So, so you're fighting a fish in and your other flags are going off because that fish tangled your other line. So I always keep them, you know, 30 or 40 feet away anyways, and sometimes even further out. And and I, I'm I'm one of these people that doesn't mind the exercise. So 
So I like moving around and it helps me find the fish quicker too if you spread them way out. Uh, think small in terms of your bait. Um, it's, it's appealing to go after the big fish and big fish do like a bigger bait, energy in, energy out, but they will also bite smaller baits when the larger ones aren't available. So if you, if you use a small to medium shiny, you'll catch little fish all the way up to big fish, you'll have more action. Um, whereas if you're just targeting big fish and you're using big baits, it's gonna be a long day when maybe just one flag or one fish. Keep the bait handy when you're checking your tip ups and moving around, keep the bait bucket always right there with you. A lot of times it's good to check to make sure your shiners are still swimming. They're active, they're not dead. If there's no oxygen where you're fishing, they're gonna slowly die. So it's good to check them and, and to move, uh, move your tip ups around. If you're catching and the flag's going off in one area, it's easier and quicker just to move those tip ups, drill some more holes and move those tip ups over near um, those the hole that's that's uh, producing. Same thing with jigging. If you're if you've got ten holes, you're jigging and you're getting them in one or two holes. Stick to those two holes because those fish are are right in that area. So those are some veteran tips for you. Um, and and there's all kinds of other tips out there. This is just a, a cursory walkthrough showing you the gear and how to be safe on the ice. Um, and this is going to be available for you to watch over and over. So I want to thank you uh, for coming along. Uh, today in this tutorial and hopefully you get out this winter and give ice fishing a try. Thank you very much.